Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, beginning with verse 28. It is also printed in your bulletin. One of the scribes came near and heard the Sadducees disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other greater commandment than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that God is one and besides God, there is no other. And to love God with all the heart and with all the understanding and, and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask Jesus any question. May God bless to our hearing and our understanding these holy words. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words that I may speak and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I want you to imagine having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a prominent person who is on the other side of the political or ideological aisle from you. This person has a large public presence, but somehow you were lucky enough to get a few moments of their time for a private conversation. Okay, you all have that person in your minds. Don't tell me, don't say it, I don't wanna know. <laughs> now, although you might see this individual as your opponent, you decide to engage them calmly with a sense of curiosity. During your conversation, you quickly move past the pleasantries because you know your time is short, and you ask them about a point they made in a speech recently. You ask them, you know, I heard you talking about, insert hot button topic here, and I want to ask you more about that. How do you feel about this aspect of it? You know that many of your friends would use this as an opportunity to try to trap the person, catch them off guard, record them saying something that they could turn into a soundbite later to discredit them. But you're not interested in sabotage. You are well-intentioned. You're full of genuine curiosity, wanting to connect with this individual. And then after you ask your question, they surprise you. They say something you agree with, and you have an out-of-body experience, and you hear yourself saying, you're right. You said you are right to this person who you could not be more different from, this person who pushes all your buttons every time you hear them speak, this person who is the living embodiment of all that is wrong with the people on the other side of the aisle. You said you're right right. And this person's response to you was not hostile or boastful. They looked you in the eye and affirmed you and said something deeply meaningful that really touched you. And you both walked away from this conversation with hearts full of gratitude because of the words you exchanged, but maybe more so because of the surprise of it all. Here, although you were well-intentioned, you did fully expect to trade barbs, 
and instead you found common ground. You agreed with each other, and you saw the value in the other person, a miracle indeed. Well, this is what happened in the gospel story that Sharon read this morning between Jesus and the Jerusalem scribe. The scribes as a character group in Mark's story were intimately involved with the conspiracy to kill Jesus. Throughout Mark's gospel, the scribes were always evaluating Jesus' activities. They judged his theology. They charged him with blasphemy because he forgave people. They judged those who he ate with. They questioned his disciples' hand-washing practices, and the list goes on. They wanted to kill Jesus because they were afraid of his popularity. Ultimately, in Mark's gospel, some of the scribes, along with the other Jerusalem leaders, were responsible for his condemnation and death. And it is to one of these very people that Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Despite their disagreements and differences, they had a moment of true connection. Jesus and this scribe agreed on something which was very threatening to the other scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees, otherwise known as the folks in power. In fact, I wonder what happened to this scribe when he returned to his colleagues, you know, the other scribes, because he must have quickly lost favor with them. The commandment that the scribe and Jesus agree on is that we are called to love God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, for those of us who are familiar with the gospel text, we have heard these words since time immemorial. Love God, love neighbor. What could possibly be controversial about that? The problem for the powerful folks is that Jesus and the scribe put these two commandments above temple law, above ritual, and above sacrifice. And guess who controlled these practices? The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the chief priests. Being the ones who controlled burnt offerings and sacrifices, they were the intermediaries between the Jewish people and God. All this time, they had been the gatekeepers to God and the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus comes along and opens those gates wide. And he says, all have access to God's grace. All you have to do is love God with every part of your being and love your fellow humans and love yourself. No middleman needed. Now, I want to digress for just a moment because these interpretations can quickly segue into anti-Semitic territory, which we have to be really careful of. Jesus' followers or other Christians will say, look, the old laws don't matter anymore. The purity laws, the temple laws, the rituals around burnt offerings and sacrifices, Sabbath rest, the Ten Commandments, all the laws that faithful Jewish people follow— None of them matter anymore because Jesus' two commandments replace all of that. This is inaccurate, for one thing, and it does a disservice to our Jewish siblings, and it can become dangerous if this interpretation is taken to an extreme. Jesus does not tell his followers not to follow the other commandments or not to keep the purity laws or offer sacrifices. Remember, Jesus was a faithful Jewish person. He simply says this is the greatest commandment. And even more, the scribe repeats back to him and says the greatest commandment is much more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices. Not that they shouldn't engage in these other rituals or that they're wrong, but the most important commandment is like the cornerstone of our faith. It's the one upon which all others are built the strength of the commandment to love comes not from the fact that it supersedes or replaces all the others, but it holds them up. Jesus is saying you can't faithfully worship God because that's what all these practices are. The burnt offerings and the rituals are ways of worshiping God. You can't do all of that or follow God's other commandments if you don't first love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I understand these two commandments kind of like a well of water. The first water in the well is loving God. Without developing a relationship with God, your well is bone dry. And then more water is added to this well by loving yourself. Now, once you love God, you can start to see yourself as God sees you, and you can learn to love yourself deeply and unconditionally. 
And now that your well is full of water, you can share that with others and nourish them spiritually and help quench their thirst because you love God and love yourself. Now, this piece about loving ourselves often gets lost in the fray, and so I think it deserves our attention for a moment. When we hear these commandments, the Reader's Digest version often is, love God and love your neighbor. But the commandment hiding in plain sight is to love ourselves. And this is complicated. There's a reason we have the famous phrase that we are our own worst critic, right? It doesn't mean egocentrism or narcissism. Loving ourselves doesn't mean putting ourselves above others or our own needs ahead of theirs. It's a love that comes from being confident and secure, resting in the knowledge that God loves us so much. We don't have to compare ourselves to others. We don't have to compete with others because we know we belong to God and we are beloved as we are and there's nothing we have to do to earn God's favor. Now, for those of you who are into the Enneagram, I know that was popular around here for a while. I will confess that I'm a three. And if you know anything about us threes, it's that our self-worth is tied to our productivity. If we aren't producing, if we don't have the approval of others, we think we don't matter. Now, even if you're not a three on the Enneagram, maybe you can relate. Jesus is talking to everyone who's hard on themselves. He's reminding us that our core value comes not from what we do or what we produce or who approves of us. It comes not from what we achieve or the promotions we get or the awards we win or even the money we earn. We have intrinsic value because we are created by God and nothing can take that away. That's what it means to love ourselves, to rest in the assurance of God's love and then pass that unconditional love along to our neighbor. This perspective helps me be empathetic towards people who are unpleasant, to put it nicely. I'm sure you've come across people like that before, the folks who seem like they have nothing kind to say, the ones who always find something to complain about. I just think those people must not love themselves very much, which is why they're having a hard time extending love and grace and compassion and empathy to others. So now that we've sorted out loving God and loving ourselves, we aren't done because Jesus tells us to love our neighbor. Now, who exactly is this neighbor that we're supposed to love? We might think it's the person in our community, the one who has a similar house, a similar lifestyle, and similar values. It's easy to love them. No problem. I want my neighborhood to be a loving place anyways, right? By now, we should know that any directive that comes from Jesus is never quite as easy or as simple as we would like it to be. And if we think it's easy, we're probably missing part of the point. In the Gospel of Luke, we hear this same story about Jesus' conversation with the scribe. But after they talk about the two commandments and get that sorted out, the scribe doesn't walk away satisfied. He asks Jesus a follow-up question. He says, Jesus, I understand that I'm supposed to love my neighbor, but who exactly is that? Can you flesh that out a little bit for me? And it's at this point in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus tells the famous story of the Good Samaritan, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with. And the moral of that story is that we are called to be a neighbor to anyone in need. This definition extends far and wide beyond those in our own community. That was the point of the man in the story being a Samaritan because he was an outsider. Now remember that Jesus was having this conversation with the scribe, the enemy, the person who was supposed to want him dead. Jesus didn't say it in so many words, but I imagine he saw the scribe as his neighbor and was inviting, to see, for the, inviting the scribe to see him as his neighbor. This is hard stuff. Jesus calls us to love God, love ourselves deeply and unconditionally, and extend that same love to everyone, even and especially those whom we disagree with. Now, you might not have the opportunity to speak one-on-one -on -one with that famous person who sits on the other side of the aisle from you, but there are people all around you, in your neighborhood, in your family, even right here in your church, who may disagree with you. 
I invite you to see them as your neighbor and to love them as you love yourself. And if you're having trouble doing that, go back to the source, go back to God, go back to our creator to fill up that well. And then try and extend some of that divine love to yourself and to your neighbor. And if we each did that, we too might draw closer to the kingdom of God. Amen.